Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to another uh, NL seminar. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, Daniel Hashrabi. Daniel, oh, sorry, my just screen just hang. Just sorry about that. Typical online demo, everything goes down. <laughs> Oh, sorry about that. We can hear you for what it's, oh, we just lost the bio, right? <laughs> yes, it just hangs on this. Okay, now we're good. Sorry about that. Oh, technicalities. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce Daniel Khashabi. Daniel is a young investigator at Allen Institute for AI uh, in Seattle. His interests lie at the intersection of artificial intelligence and natural language processing. He earned his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and his undergraduate degree from Amir Kabir University of Technology, also known as Tehran Polytechnic. So it's our absolute pleasure today to uh, have Daniel today. Please join me in enjoying his talk and welcoming him. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you for inviting me. I'm uh, very glad to be here. Um, um, yeah, if you have any clarification questions, feel free to interrupt me. Otherwise, let's delay all the kind of open-ended questions a little after the talk. You can see my slides, right? Good, okay. All right, let's let's get it started. Let me start by reminding you about one of the widely known successes of AI. Just a few years ago, AlphaGo defeated the human champion in uh, uh, in the ancient game of Go, followed by lots of excitement, excitement about the new heights that AI has achieved. While AlphaGo was an exciting breakthrough, I think it is a fair question to ask whether such technologies or AlphaGo itself can really solve any other problem that we might be interested in. For example, you know, think of this hypothetical conversation between me and AlphaGo. Do you think AlphaGo, you know, I'm at me asking AlphaGo, can you help me with my presentation? Probably no response. Can you play poker? After all, AlphaGo is also uh, it, it, it plays a game that in terms of rules, it's, it's not that different from poker. Can you play poker? Probably not. Can you explain the game that you're good at? It cannot even explain itself. Right? So technologies like AlphaGo, as impressive as they are in what they do, they're quite narrow. AlphaGo is incapable of solving any other problem in the world. Similarly, in the past few years in NLP, we have built so many benchmarks. And for each of these benchmarks, for each of these challenges, we have built systems that can achieve incredible performance. The downside of it all is that all these major successes in NLP, they're focused on niche domains. For example, we have built models for a squat data set. Um, however, <clears throat> many of these, even the best system on squad still doesn't work on any other benchmark. Uh, for example, take Hotbot QA, which is a very similar problem in terms of definition, in terms of setup to squad. And there's something odd about claiming that we, really the community, we are making progress in terms of language understanding when the resulting models cannot simultaneously understand different aspects of human reasoning. For example, numerical reasoning, compositional reasoning. After all, all of, all of these different aspects are relevant aspects of language understanding. <clears throat> Let me try to show that, uh, that point now pictorially. Uh, think of this giant blue space as the space of all the problems that we are interested in. <clears throat> the x-axis, I'm defining it to be the collection of the problem definitions or the metaphorical breadth of our problems. Uh, for example, we have problem definitions for Go, chess, these are the kind of logical, well-defined problems. And you have uh, problem definitions for kind of language problems that you're interested in, squad, half theory, and so on. The depth of this, this blob is the comp indicates the complexity of each problem in space. For example, within the domain defined by the rules of Go, you have you know, a space of all the problems with certain complexities. Similarly, for any of the uh, other problem definitions, you can think of this, you know, this kind of um, really uh, think of this inaccurate, but like high level uh, problem definition and their complexities. The issue that I'm alarmed by is that we, are ex we excessively, we really the community, we excessively focus on depth. We try to make the most sophisticated Go player. 
similarly in NLP, we try to make the strongest models for each data set. But there is very little time is spent in terms of breadth, that is building models that support a broader range of tasks, right? So that's the issue that uh, I wanna really uh, bring attention to. So and in summary, in, in this talk, I'm advocating for more focus on the breadth of our progress. We need to build models that cover a broad range of tasks. And I'm going to contextualize this, this vision in terms of two recent works in question, on question answering. In the first part, I'm gonna talk about transfer between different QA formats that is building a single system that works across several different versions of question answering. In the second part, I'm going to introduce a system that learns to decompose uh, complex question, question answering uh, using existing well-defined systems. In terms of technical details, these two projects are quite different. They're accomplishing very different goals, but they're united in that both of these projects have elements that uh, highlight uh, the target goal that I mentioned in the introduction, which is broadening the scope of question answer, right? And I'm gonna talk about it in detail during the talk. So this is my roadmap. Hopefully I've motivated uh, what, is, what, is, what is the vision that I'm after in long term. I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about two technical uh, pieces and then I'm gonna go back to the big picture and end it. Okay, let's just start with the first technical part. Um, like I said, uh, when, as you I'm sure know, there are a lot of data sets that we have built for question answering in the field and there are so many of them. Uh, just, just to contextualize it a little bit, uh, the, the squat data set, it, it popularized, popularized the extractive format. Where right? given a question, uh, you have to you have to extract an answer from that uh, accompanying uh, paragraph and and provide it and, and show it as an answer. Okay? Similarly, uh, multiple choice questions should also be very familiar to many of us. Uh, given a question, supplemented with a bunch of candidate answers, you have to uh, pick the correct candidate. And there's so many other data sets that we won't have time to get into. So many other data sets that we won't have time to get into. Um, essentially, each of these new data sets, they provide slightly different, slightly alter alternative evaluation protocols for a slightly different phenomenon. But even though they're, each of them are different, that's why they publish papers, even though each of them introduce slightly different phenomena, they're inherently different realizations of the same task. They're all question answered. So they're not that different. Okay. So, and let me uh, now like mention a problem that I see in the field that kind of goes in the face of what I described previously, which is somehow the field has become um, data set driven. Somehow we are fine, the community has accepted that it is okay to encode data set specific assumptions into design of our models, mainly mainly really the last layer of our language models. We design them to be data set specific. For example, uh, it is not unusual to see a paper that <clears throat> introduces a yes, no question answering data set, and in the final layer of their system, they have a binary classifier. Or it's not unusual to see, in fact, probably all of them, see a system of multiple choice QA, and, uh, and in the final layer of their system, they have this condition or right? they have this function that picks exactly one of the candidate answers. And pretty much you have these data set specific or format specific assumptions for all the versions of question answer. And I have, I am troubled by these, these assumptions. I think um, format specific assumptions create hard barriers for generalization of systems across different formats. For example, if you, if you have a system that is engineered for yes, no questions, you cannot really run it on squat question by, by definition because that's how it is engineered. And additionally, there's a missed opportunity here as I will show later on during my presentation, a QA system that has the freedom to uh, be trained across different versions of QA has access to a much bigger pool of supervision and uh, they'll be able to uh, perform uh, higher, higher and better than a system that is limited to individual formats. And so uh, just to say the same thing with a little bit of more graphics, within the, the, within the boundaries defined by each of the QA formats, we have made a lot of progress. We have built good systems for extractive QA. We have built really good systems for multiple choice QA. 
My argument is that the boundaries that separate these different versions of QA, in many cases, they're artificial and perhaps unnecessary, given that there's a lot of sharedness between these different, seemingly different QA. Uh, what we are gonna do is we are gonna tear down the, the boundaries between these and we are gonna build a single model that performs uh, jointly between all these different uh, formats, uh, hopefully with, uh, with the goal to really uh, doing even better than doing, doing it separately. Okay, let, let me, now that, now, now that I have uh, motivated what is it that I wanna do here, let me give you a high level definition of the system that I have in mind. Let's, uh, uh, let's start with the high level de definitions of the system. I'm gonna call it unified QA because in a sense it's, it unifies different variants, different versions of uh, QA formats. It, it's, it's supposed to be a single system that works on a variety of QA formats. And the input to the system uh, should be naturally readable. Basically humans should be able to answer every single instance by just reading the input as, as is. Right. Let me try to give an example of what I mean here. Consider this example. What causes uh, what causes sound? A bunch of and a bunch of candidate answers listed. Humans don't need to be told that this is a multiple choice question. You can just read it and infer it, and that's exactly what I expect the system to be able to do as well. Here's another example: Is Jamaica considered part of the United States? Um, and one paragraph followed by the question. Again, humans don't need to be told that this is a yes, no question. You can just infer it by reading the input. Here's another one. Uh, what type of musical instrument did you bring to China? And one context paragraph. Again, you don't need to be told what is the format of this question or what data set it belongs to. You can just infer it from the input that's shown to you. Uh, overall, in, 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 in across all of these examples, hopefully I was able to con convince you that by an appropriate encoding of these different uh, questions that belong to different formats, uh, there is no need to really uh, separate them from each other. You can just frame them as input text and give it to your system. So in a sense, I described our encodings that uh, the encodings that we are going to use for uh, for these instances, everything is encoded as the inputs are text and the expected output is text. Uh, and we always we always uh, encode the question in our encoding. The question always comes first, and all the additional information are appended after this special uh, marker followed by the question. Right? This is our encoding, and. Um, and the key technical uh, technical requisite that you're gonna borrow from the field is text-to-text -text architecture, like T5 and BART. Uh, let me re-emphasize that in this encoding of the instances, we never explicitly mention the format of the given instance or the data that it belongs to. It's, it is something that has to be inferred from the statement of the question, okay? So let's see, let's see a little bit of empirical intuition here. The first intuition that uh, one needs to verify is whether there is any value in mixing pairs of data sets. Right? So here's an experiment where I'm building, um, I'm training my T5 on instances of race data set, which is a multiple choice data set. So I'm gonna show the results of T5 trained on race data set, evaluated on race uh, itself and a different multiple choice data set. And here are the corresponding bars. No surprise so far. Now I'm gonna train the same architecture, same pre-training, same architecture on race as well as a squad. As I mentioned, race is multiple choice. Squad is extracted QA. Seems like apples and oranges, right? Kind of seems ridiculous. Why would you even train this? So here's the result. Uh, on both of these test target test data, um, the blue system does better than just training on green. So I don't know about you, but when I was seeing these improvements, my first instinct was there must be a bug somewhere. Quite surprising how one can gain so pretty much, you know, so, so much by creating these seemingly odd combinations between the data sets. Um, overall, um, we have more experiments of uh, like this in the paper where we show that uh, there exists many pairs of data sets with different formats that can benefit from each other. So. This, uh, maybe, maybe I'll just step here for in case there is any question. Um, just quickly on the, um, so MC test, 
is definitely okay. These are both multiple choice data sets. Um, uh, are you, you you're not treating them differently? So you're not encoding each of the answers and getting the best choice. You're just letting the thing predict some masked word answer. Um, so um, are 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 you asking? Uh, are are you are you comparing green and blue or this green well, and green? In, in any of these, these are, I mean, this is four different evaluations on multiple choice data set. I'm just asking when you evaluate multiple choice, are you, you know, because it is multiple choice, are you doing the multiple choice kind of um, action where you uh, encode, say, the question and then one answer, the question, the second answer, question, answer. Um, or are you doing like, I guess what you said in the beginning was you encode the question and then like A, something B, something C, something D, something, and then you let it choose. It's just some auto regressive output. Is that correct? I, I think uh, maybe if I can, if I may remind uh, yeah. this slide, you feed your multiple choice question as is and with candidates encoding, uh, encoded as part of your input. These are just a string that you feed to the model. And the model is supposed to give you or that's how I train them. I want them to give me the string corresponding to the correct answer. Okay, right. So, so it is just a, it's an auto regressive output in this case. It's not like a birdie yeah. classification, right? Okay, good. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, in this case, if it said B, would you get a correct answer or no? What What is it? Sorry. If the output was B in parentheses instead of vibrations, would that be correct answer or incorrect answer? Uh, yeah, that would be correct answer. Although that okay. rarely happens uh, because by design, I want well, I want models to give me like a, uh, as opposed to symbols, I'm, I train them to give me like a string of an answer. Like so, whether whether it is an extractive QA or multiple choice, I want them to um, just stick to the string of them. Okay, thanks. I'm um, sorry. Quick follow up on that. Um, yeah. I. Uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, what what if the model gives you a word that is not one of the answers? Is that even possible? Uh, that is possible. Yes. Uh, in that case, uh, your evaluation script uh, doesn't give the model any credit. I see. Um, so, so so vibration yeah. would also be wrong. Uh, yes, correct. If you give if you pick a correct incorrect answer or if you produce garbage, you get no credit. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me continue. Uh, if there's more questions, we can stop later. Uh, so let me remind you about what was the lesson here. What I'm arguing here is that there are many pairs of data sets that benefit from each other. These are pairs of data sets of different formats that benefit from each other, right? So that a natural next question that comes up is what happens if instead of mixing pairs of data sets, you mix many data sets, right? And that motivates building this, this system that, uh, we have a uh, unified QA version one that is trained on uh, eight data sets of four different formats. Uh, we have uh, data sets of extractive format, abstractive QA, multiple choice, and ESL. Right? So it's single system trained on all of these. Uh, relatively a simple design. Uh, the, the first intuition that we want to verify is whether unified QA is as good as dedicated systems trained for individual data sets. So here's such an explanation uh, experiment. Let me explain this. The blue bars uh, correspond to unified QA, a single system that is trained on multiple data sets of different formats. The green bars are data set specific models. That is models that are evaluated on the same data set that they were trained on. The result that we see here is that uh, unified QA performs almost as good as targeted data set. Um, and in fact, if you look at the average bar on the right column, unified QA on average clearly output performs data set or format specific systems. So overall, what you get is that you get flexibility. Unified QA gives you flexibility uh, of being able to address uh, multiple versions of QA while compromising almost none compared to these data set specific experts. Right, so that's really the flexibility that it brings for you. Um, another experiment, uh, well, in a, another setup that one might be interested in is, what if, what if we only care about particular benchmark? What if I don't really care about flexibility? What if I don't care about multiple choice? All that I want is just maximizing my performance on a particular benchmark. Um, 
and th th this is such an experiment where um, where we are going to fine tune uh, T5, the architecture, architecture that we started with, with individual benchmarks. Uh, T5 at the time was shown to be state of the art on all of these benchmarks. And now, now that we have built a unified QA, you know, remember that unified QA is basically the same architecture, it's MT5, but pre trained or pre fine tuned on a wide range of QA tasks. We fine tune that architecture on individual subtasks. Right? So, and this is the result. Uh, so what we see is that fine-tuning unified QA consistently dominates fine-tuning on a vanilla T5. Intuitively, uh, unified QA has had more exposure to different versions of QA, so it is more well-positioned to achieve higher scores after just a little bit of fine-tuning. This is especially effective when you have uh, very limited training data for your target QA task. Um, we have a more extensive uh, experiment on this. At the, at the time that we published the results, it was a uh, state of the art on same data set. Um, a lot has changed since then. But yeah, in case you're interested, in, there's more on that. Um, any questions here? Sorry, uh, yes, sir. Uh, go ahead. Sorry for just a question. Can you move back to the last slide? Yeah. So in this slide, uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with the format of all data sets. Besides a squad, are there any like uh, passage retrieval types of data set here? Uh, there is no, in the setups that we are interested in or the ones that we studied, study, they, there is no retrieval involved. Uh, if there is, mainly because of technical uh, detail, it just makes it a little difficult for us to find. I'm but, just asking, I was interested to see, is this a valid uh, interpretation that from your last slide, a squad seemed helping multi-choice questions, but here adding a bunch of other formats is not helping squad, meaning that's that- really, Yeah, that's a really good observation on, on that. Yes, uh, there is, there is, so yeah, that's a really good question. What, what is it about these data sets? I'm, maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, making your question now slightly more abstract and high level. What is it about these data sets that tend to help each other? Is this uh, their format? Is this their domain or is it their size? Um, you, you have pointed out a really cute observation that is quite, uh, even though help other data sets, on average, what we see is that Unified QA uh, does this slightly worse uh, compared to a squad specific system. Uh, and this might be related to the size of the squad that since it's big, you know, it, it helps other formats. On the other hand, since it's big, uh, it, just a, a data set specific system, maybe it doesn't really get to see all the artifacts or all the patterns that are specific to squad. So if you're really training on many data sets, you're drift away from squad specific patterns. Um, so, uh, my, I guess my question for you was really too explanatory, but <laughs> basically, I think you have a good observation, but like exact dynamics of what helps what is not completely clear to us. I see, I see. Um, and, and just to be, sorry, did you have another question? No, no, go ahead, John. Um, so uh, are these, in the, the green bars, are these dedicated models, are these unified QA models trained only on their data or are they truly dedicated models? So for example, in squad, you have a model that's gonna output span boundaries and thus you can only actually get an extraction. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, these are, uh, we use, no, these are, uh, in a sense, these are, well, I do, I, well, maybe, it is, this is closer to your first item, but- The unified like, QA model, yeah. Yeah, but uh, let me just emphasize that these are, uh, I'm essentially dedicated models in this case, they're essentially T5 mm -hmm. fine tuned for each of these architectures. So um, yeah, they don't uh, output the span, span uh, boundaries, but they output the string, but this is exactly the same setup that the original T5 paper also followed mm -hmm. to my understanding. Got it. And hi Daniel, I have a question about the squad two here. Like um, what if, like uh, there are unanswerable questions. Um, what will be the output of unified QA? Um, 
you, yeah, you're expected to output um, um, not answerable. There is a special token that corresponds to oh, not see. enough information. Uh, and for the multiple choice um, QA, would the order of the options matter like in the, in, uh, in the input? That's a really good question. Um, mostly no, but I've seen in extreme cases when uh, let's say you have, uh, you know, if you have like, let's say 10 candidates, uh, there, the chance of you picking uh, the 10th candidate or is much lower than the chance of picking the first, first or one of the first four candidates because most of the mm -hmm. data sets that we have trained on uh, the answers are yeah. is the initial part. Oh, I see. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, before before uh, before I end, let me just mention a few words on a very relevant point since this comes up frequently on transfer learning or multitask learning. Well. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you all know that there's a large body of work in this direction on uh, basically on trying to exploit commonalities between different tasks. Uh, my understanding is that in this literature, the majority of the efforts on multitask learning, they don't result in meaningful gains. And here you might ask, well, it doesn't seem like it works for others. How come it works for you? This is a very good question that I wanna address. Um, my, here's my argument. In most cases, the failure of multitask learning or their success for that matter should not be blamed on the algorithm itself, but rather on the choice of the tasks. In many works, um, they often select an excessively broad set of tasks. For example, in Rafael et al., the, the original T5 paper, they experimented with a really diverse set of NLP tasks like machine translation, summarization. And the, these, the, this choice of diverse tasks, they have very little in common, right? So, but here in this study, we choose our tasks uh, in a way that we stay within the boundaries of QA and show, that, show the transfer across these slightly more uh, limited uh, subset of tasks. That's really the key difference that, in my opinion, that enables us to show the transfer in this study. Okay, let me try to summarize what I, what I, what I try to convey in this section. Uh, as I argued, uh, the field excessively, uh, excessively relies on format-specific assumptions for system design. Uh, instead, uh, I believe we should move towards more general QA architectures and push for broader scope for QA system design. And as I said, there's incentive in doing this. We showed gains from mixing different QA data sets of different formats. And the byproduct of this study is the system that we introduced, Unified QA, a single pre-trained or pre-fine-tuned uh, system that works across many uh, common QA data sets. Uh, the systems and all the models that we have pre-trained, they're pre-fine-tuned, they're available online. If, you, if you're writing a paper, it's, it's the night before your deadline and you don't have time to build a baseline, it's very easy to use. Just use it for, uh, any setups that you have, and I, as I promised, is quite versatile. It works on a very wide range of formats. Uh, let me move on to the second uh, technical portion of my talk. And in this part, I'm going to focus on complex QA QA problems. That is, questions that require some form of reasoning. There are already a couple of benchmarks for this task. For example, uh, we have drop data sets. Uh, which contains questions like this, how many years did it take for the service sector to rebound? So for answering this, you have to first figure out uh, in what your service sector uh, went down, in what year did it rebound, and how many, and do some math here to find out how many years did it take. Or you have hot by QA kind of data sets, questions like this, what was the nationality of the director of the Simpsons? You have to first figure out who's the director of the symptoms, then, then based on that answer, find out its nationality. Now, so for each of these data sets, the community has made tremendous progress in building data set specific models. The leaderboards for each of these data sets, they're almost saturated. However, after several years, we still do not have a single system that works reasonably well on both of these data sets, right? So that connects to the limited breadth problem that I highlighted in the introduction. And part of that problem is that these data sets, they represent 
different distributions. Both of them are compositional data set, but the, the distribution of these compositions are not exactly similar, you know? they're different. So the challenge for us is how can we build a system that generalizes, generalizes well uh, to, all of, uh, to, to all these data sets? So in particular, in this study, we are gonna focus on drop and hotspot QA. And the guiding principle that we are gonna follow is that even though the distribution represented by these two data sets are different, uh, if you look at the sub questions of the of their questions, in that sub question level, they, they should be similar enough, right? So it's just a matter of breaking it into small enough pieces, and in, in that uh, in, in in that space, under that space, hopefully they, there should be some form of similarity that will help you generalize across the two data sets. So that's really the idea. So we are going to build a general framework to decompose complex questions into sub questions. And, and, and we are gonna have a system uh, that really addresses uh, that, those sub questions. And let me, uh, this was a really high level. Let me try to make it less high level by uh, by really giving you uh, the big picture that I have. Um, so this is, this is the description of the proposed architecture that we have in mind. Really a simple way to describe the idea here is standing on the shoulders of giants, right? So in our setup, the giants are these uh, solved QA problems. These are, uh, for example, a squat solver or a symbolic solver like a calculator. These models, they're good at what they're designed for, right? But they're essentially blind at solving uh, problems that are slightly more complex. The green box here is our next question generator. Its role is to break down a given complex question, decompose it into sub-questions and communicate it to appropriate modules. And a crucial aspect here is that the communication between next question generator and individual modules, it has to be done in terms of natural language. Um, and in order for this language communication to be successful, the generated sub-questions need to be understandable to the modules. I'm gonna get back to this point since it's very important. Uh, the, the, basically, this is, we call this general family of architectures. We call it hex modular networks since they consist of modules for different skills and the language of communication between these different modules, they are all in natural language. And the system that I'm gonna present here, I will call it modular QA. It's an instantiation of hex modular network for the two data sets that I mentioned here, drop and hop up here. Any questions here? Okay, I'm gonna move on. Um, let's see an example of how this big picture would work in practice or for how I want it to work in ideal scenario, right? So this is an input question given to me. This is from, data, from the drop data set. How many years did it take for the service sector to rebound? I have two modules. I have a squat solver and I have calculator. Uh, the squat solver cannot really address this problem because it's uh, it's more it's too difficult for a squat to address this, this kind of question. It's not really trained for this kind of questions. It is the job of my next question generator to break it down into something that is understandable to a squat. Right? So ideally, I want my next question generator to extract the sub question. In what year did the service sector rebound? Right. And squat solver is going to say, let's say 2003, based on a paragraph that is supplemented. Next question that I'm not showing here. And then uh, next question generator should uh, should realize that there is oh there's another piece of the question that we should we should address. Maybe it will generate when did the service sector take a hit? Squat solver can answer this question. It will say 2002. Next question generator should figure out that now we need some mathematical operation and we should formulate an math, of, math uh, question for our calculator. And calculator knows how to address this and it's gonna give you an answer one and that's gonna be the answer to the question. Okay, so there's one immediate benefit that one can foresee from such, such an architecture design. Uh, obviously, we can see the reasoning chain we, we, that helped us go through, uh, go through this. So it is really interpretable. That's really the immediate benefit that you get. But obviously, um, it's not a non, it's a non-trivial design. Right? So the design question for us, or the research question for us, is how would you go about building such an interactive system? That's 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 what 
I'm going to focus on for the remainder of this part. So the, the main component that one needs to come up with is the next question generator, right? So this, is the, this is the component that decomposes a given complex question into sub-question. The modules are, we assume that they are given to us, they're frozen. So for example, squat solver, a calculator, we are not gonna touch them, they're frozen. This is the only component that we are gonna uh, work with. And one, one constraint that we have in mind is that the decompositions that you generate here they need to be understandable to the, to, to, to the modules that you have. And as I mentioned, they're frozen. The only thing that needs to adapt uh, is this next question generator, right? So how, how would you build such a system? Uh, one approach, and I like to think of it as a naive approach, is to create annotated data, right? So we hire a bunch of cloud workers and they build, uh, given a complex question and maybe it's answered, they decompose it into a bunch of subsets. Right? There are already a bunch of works on that. I argue that crowdsourcing the composition is not, is not the right way to go. Uh, it relies on human annotations, which is costly. Besides, the generated decompositions, they're not designed to be comprehensible or comprehensible to existing models. Right? So I don't want, I don't want to do that. Uh, what else we can do? Here, I'm gonna describe what was our approach. Let me just mention that this, this approach is not necessarily uh, the best way to do it. Now we realize, but this was, uh, this was the way we, we, we did it in our paper, but uh, in the pipeline, we have slightly better approaches too. But if you have better approaches too, I'm also happy to hear that. Uh, let's hear what, what was the route that we took. The first piece of the puzzle that we tried to define is the language of communication. Like I said, uh, the decomposer should be, decompose the questions in a way that is understandable to individual modules. And to do this, we use the same data that was used for building our modules, the question answering models. We use the same data to build question generators. Uh, essentially, um, any question generated by this data is going to be with, with very like, high likelihood. It's going to be understandable to the corresponding QA system. For example, if you use the squad to build a QA system, use the same, we are going to use the squad data to build a question generator system. Specifically, we build this conditional question generation model that is conditioned on three key parameters. First, we have uh, the suggested vocabulary uh, to be used in the generated questions, the expected answer of the generated question, and the document, the context document from which we are going to extract the questions. Let me instantiate this. Uh, for instance, if you instantiate this function uh, with these parameters, let's say you want to use these vocabulary in the question, you want the answers, the answers to the questions to be this, and there's a context document that uh, I'm not showing here, we would expect this QQG system to give you questions like this. Right? Now, if I change the answer, uh, this parameter, the expected answer uh, into given to this QG system, I, the, the, I would expect QG system to modify its questions and give me slightly different questions. Right? So such a such a guided question generation is one of, is, is the key tool that we will use to build a noisy supervision for our question decomposition. Another piece of puzzle is labeling uh, our complex questions with high level types that describe the kind of reasoning they used in them. Right. So. Here I'm showing examples of the types or the categories that we used for, for our question. Uh, we have, for example, conjunction questions, composition questions, and so on. Uh, let me just read you an example. For example, comparison questions. What ancestral group is smaller, Irish or Italian? In a sense, this label describes what kind of reasoning is used in this question. Uh, or conjunction questions. What is, what is politician in? You have two attributes and you want to pick an answer that fits both of these attributes. Um, and the reason that we are going to infer, uh, infer this kind of high level type is because we want to use this type to build a, a, a noisy supervision uh, for question decomposition that is a function of the type of reasoning used for each question. In practice, inferring these types uh, in practice, inferring these types uh, is done using a relatively large set of rules. These are high-level rules, but they're simple that we have included in one appendix. 
Uh, I would emphasize that these heuristics are high level and they're going to be used across multiple data sets. They are not really data sets specific. Uh, to explain the rest of the idea, I'm going to assume that you're working with the difference questions, but the overall idea should be quite similar for the rest of the question types. So let's assume that you're playing with a difference question type. Then, uh, then based on uh, the question type that we have inferred, we are going to form a decomposite decomposition, decomposition program that is specific to the inferred type. For example, if the type that we have inferred for this given question is of type difference, uh, here's how my decomposition program would look like. It consists of three subsets, three sub questions. Uh, the first two steps are generated by my question generation system that is trained I, on a squad, as I mentioned. And the last step is, a, is produced for our symbolic solve. Uh, the parameters here are uh, is basically the same non-stop words that uh, were used in the phrasing of the original question. And the, the parameters, uh, the expected answers here, are, 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 uh, are, the, are two numbers, pairs of numbers that have difference equal to the uh, answer of the, with difference equal to the answer of the complex question. And note that these parameters, these choices, they're again, they're a function of the type that you have inferred, right? So for every type, you have a different decomposition program with a slightly different parameters uh, that is again, function of the type that you have inferred. Uh, as you would imagine, you would get a lot of triplets, a lot of tri triple questions, uh, here based on this, uh, many of them might be noisy. So you're gonna do a little bit of filtering here. You're gonna delete those uh, triplets that don't cover enough of your complex question or they introduce too many new words, right? So, and you're gonna use those triplets as our, uh, to, uh, as our uh, annotated data, uh, really noisy supervision for building a decomposite system. Right. Now let's assume that I have those triplets. Uh, I'm going to build, I'm going to train my next question generator to do that decomposition. So Sorry, I, I, yeah. Dan, uh, maybe I missed this. Uh, what, uh, can, you, can you say again the uh, interplay between the required vocabulary and the question? Uh, does the, is the required vocabulary something that's given or, or is, it that, is it what your uh, model is, question generator is, is generating? Uh, are, are you asking how, uh, what is it that I feed to QG or how QG does that? Uh, exactly, yeah. What is Q vocab? How do you generate it? Uh, and it, yeah, where does that come from? Um, so yeah, let me step back to here. Uh, so this QG system is, is something that you train on, um, let's say on your squad data set. Right, so squad data set was meant to be a, I guess, QA data set, but you can kind of repurpose that data set, right? So basically, um, uh, for, uh, for any question that you have on a squad, uh, you can come up with, you know, like a, a slightly noisy uh, set of questions were used in the statement of that question, let's say, excluding the stoppers and so on. Uh, that would be part of your input. You know the expected answer to that a question that was annotated in the squad and you, you know a document. So basically you build a text generation model that would generate questions for you given, given, the, doc, given the paragraph, given a noisy vocabulary that was inferred that we have, you know, you have a bunch of rules that we have inferred from the statement of that question I expect you to answer. Oh, got, gotcha. So, so that was my question. Um, so Q vocab is generated using rules uh, from the original answer yeah. of squad, okay. Exactly. Thanks. Uh, Dania, I also have a question. Uh, can you please go to slide 37, please? Yeah, uh, actually maybe not, uh, 35. 35. Yeah. Uh, so my question here is, so based on the question type, you decide that you're gonna have, let's say here, you're gonna have three different like sub questions. So my question is that, do you have any model to extract the type of question, like the difference or other type of question? And if you have it, do you have a training data for like train your model on top of this classifier? Yeah, so we, um, so the, for, for inferring the types, uh, we, we use a bunch of rules. Um, 
that are relatively simple that use the vocabulary of the question. So for example, you know, if I can just go back to the example that I had here, if, 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 if your question ends with, you know, comparing two entities, this must, this must be a comparison question. You know, another hint here is that there's which here that could give you a hint that, uh, you know, maybe you're comparing two things. Uh, in 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 uh, you know uh, so in a sense basically what I'm saying is that we don't have a, a classifier for doing this. Uh, we didn't want to in fact have a classifier because we want this these rules to be very simple, uh, high level. And um, let me also emphasize that this is not something that you use during the inference time. You only use this heuristic to build your noisy supervision for for supervision that you're going to use to decompose your original question right so in fact these types could be really inaccurate but the i but the hope is that uh, if 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 overall the labels that they give you in let's say 90 percent of the cases if they're accurate 90 percent or like relatively good portion of your noisy noisy decomposition uh they're gonna be reasonably accurate that you can use them to train your a decomposer model Okay, so it's based on more like kind of heuristic rules. It's not a training yeah. model. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I've got a follow-up question, if I may. Yeah. Uh, so we did some question answering in our natural language group at ISI some 20 years ago. And so we did focus quite a bit on classifying questions. So uh, if you have a question like, you know, who is the chancellor of Germany or who is Angela Merkel, uh, those would be very two different questions. Uh, one of them being so like why famous person uh, do you, do you try to really get those types? I mean, would you have some heuristics or some way that would map questions like, uh, you know, who is Angela Merkel or what is Angela Merkel known for or why is she famous to one question type and then take it from there? Or is that kind of more holistically part of your question answering system? Oh, uh, sorry, um, I, I missed the question part. Um, so do you have a classifier that, for example, would map a question such as, uh, you know, who was Albert Einstein to something like why famous person uh, question type in order to kind of facilitate the answering um, or, or do you not? We do not. Okay. Yeah, we do not. And um, um, so, um, yeah, we do not have that. Um, the reason that, I, if I, maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but I think the kind of the typing that you mentioned might be slightly different than this kind of typing. Am I correct in understanding that? The type that you had in mind is more like, you know, like who did something, something is of type, you know, who questioned it. Like you're looking for the answer should be of type person. Yeah, it's like a semantic. So what is the semantic type of the answer? So if you have white famous, you know, person, then you would maybe focus on discoveries, inventions, you know, leaders of countries and so forth. Yeah. And, uh, and, and, and one of the types might be multiple choice or some of what you have over here, but there is certainly, uh, you know, we had quite a focus on different semantic types. Yeah. We, no, we do not use that kind of typing, mainly because the modules that we use for answering sub questions, they're relatively reliable. If you just Frame if you re if you phrase your sub questions in an accurate way, SWOT model just is pretty good in putting whether it's a person question. Are you asking? Are you looking for a date and so on? Um, but the difficulty for us is uh, uh, is this reasoning typing kind of question. Right? What kind of reasoning is this? Is this do we need to do some comparison between two entities? Do we need to do some you know, some algebra kind of? So I, I I think you have a good point, but I think uh, at least on this data set that we played with, the challenge was slightly different. Hey, Daniel. Uh, so just one question. So uh, during inference, how does the model decide whether the question needs to be uh, sort of broken down into simple questions or not? Because I would assume that a question may be simple or complex depending on the context that's given to answer that question, right? Yeah, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? So you don't have to, you don't have to, uh, 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 so essentially based on these uh, questions, so you take, okay, let me just go back to the big picture. 
uh, you have a, a few instances from your complex data set, right? So these are these kind of examples. You have to input and you have to output. Uh, you, you, for, you infer a bunch of, uh, you look at, you know, you're expert, you look at your data sets and you infer that, you know, I have, I have these kind of reasoning types and you build a heuristic for inferring those reasoning types and you build the composition programs for each of those types. And you use that to build the compositions for each of those questions. Now you use that, I guess that actually brings me to the, this is like this, that I didn't explain completely. Uh, you use that noisy decomposition supervision to build a decomposition decomposer. Uh, and what this decomposer does is given a complex question, it, uh, it produces a sub question. In the first round, you, uh, you don't have any decomposition. So first you're gonna generate first decomposition. In the second round, you're gonna generate second decomposition given the first decomposition and its answer. And then you know, you're gonna continue like this until you get to the end of the decompositions. And one thing that maybe the, so this might be something that's relevant to your question. In each of these sub-question generations, the, the next question generator is in charge of telling us what module should answer this generated sub-question, right? And that's, that's the kind of information that we have from this, this decomposition program, because we know that this QG, for example, corresponds to the squad. So if, 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 if so this, the first generated sub-question by decomposer should be answered by the squad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. So looks like the time is running really faster than I am moving. Let me try to, in the interest of time, let me try to finish. And then if we have more time, we can discuss. Thank you. Okay, let me move towards a bunch of, just a tiny bit of empirical results here. But before I show that, let me just mention this relevant work. Um, neural module networks is quite relevant to what we are doing here. Um, just like our setup, the neural module networks, uh, they also consist of modules dedicated for the particular skills that you might be interested in. The, the key difference here is that, unlike our setup, where communication between the modules is textual, in neural module networks, the, the language of communication is based on uh, attention rates and soft vectors. Okay, so one empirical evaluation, as promised, I'm going to show evaluations on these two data sets. Uh, so each row is one system evaluated on two data sets. Right? Uh, the first two systems that I'm going to show are based on neural modular networks, they're, they're modular baselines. Um, that are uh, one of them is uh, one of them is this one of them was was designed for the drop data set the other one was designed for the hotbot QA data set on the two data sets that they were designed for they're doing pretty well um, however uh, there it's very not it's very difficult to modify the architectures to make them run across other data sets and it's, it's basically all of these, uh, all of, all of the, both of these systems, they have data set specific assumptions and they're designed that makes them really hard to uh, generalize to other uh, data sets. However, the system that here we, uh, we have built based on the uh, high level plan that I introduced, it, it, is, it, it gives you competitive performance compared to both of these systems uh, while giving you the flexibility to work across both of these data sets as well as textual explanations. I'm also showing two black box baselines. These are systems more like you know, Bert and Roberta uh, with, uh, with one final layer fine tuned or engineered for particular data sets. These two systems also do pretty well. They don't give you any explanations. Um, they, do, they, do, they do the best when they're fine tuned for the particular target task but they use uh, some assumptions and supervision that are specific to the target data set and really they don't, uh, they don't uh, generalize to other data sets. So even on these, uh, so the system that we have built, uh, it is still not too far from these data set specific baselines. So uh, basically what I'm showing here is in summary, we have an interpretable uh, model with competitive performance on drop and and on drop and hotbot query with additional emphasis on this one. To summarize what, what we saw here, uh, I introduced text, text modular networks. Uh, I, I think this is a relatively general purpose framework for solving complex questions. And based on this conceptual framework, I introduced uh, modular query. Uh, modular query was 
really the instant, one instantiation of fixed modular networks. Um, I think uh, this was our first try to instantiate it this way. I think there will be a better and uh, better ways to uh, use uh, build models based on this conceptual framework. And I I, I would be glad if you if you also uh, if you have ideas on that. Uh, and the benefit, as I argue, is that um, we build, we, were, we managed to build a system that is, while being interpretable, it wor works on two data sets at the same time. This is the more breadth uh, idea that uh, I was highlighting in the group. Let me circle back to my introduction briefly, just so that we can wrap it up uh, on, a, on a complete message. Um, as, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, in the current state of NLP, we do not focus enough on the breadth of our programs. We are really obsessed with data set or depth, uh, as, as, it is, as it should be indicated by how we are chasing leaderboards for individual data sets. And the two works that I presented here, in my opinion, there are, there are different ways of expanding the scope of our systems. In the first part, I, I talked about a system that uh, uh, that is supposed to work on a broader range of, uh, broader versions of question answering. In the second part, I introduced the framework to uh, build a single system that generalizes uh, to, to two different multi-hop data sets. I would emphasize that these two, these two segments that I showed, they're not really just two systems. I, I, the way I see them, they're really uh, initial steps towards a broader view of machine comprehension. Um, uh, I think I think this is a good place to stop. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daniel, for the great talk and all uh, and all the questions that you answered. Thank you, everyone, for asking your questions. I think with that, now I can open the room for more questions from the audience. Hey, Daniel. Uh just one quick question. So um, did you do a comparison with uh, like just uh, question simplification or using a paraphrasing type of module to just simplify the question and then uh, do the answering compared to like breaking the question into different like simpler modules? Uh, we, we did not. And uh, we haven't, maybe there's value there, but my intuition is that uh, the reason that these data sets, let's say Drop or Hotbot 3 is complex is not because the language is complex, it's not because it's using, let's say Shakespeare and kind of English. It's, it's complex because you know, there are different elements of the reasoning. So I, think, I don't think simplification is gonna be enough. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, just something to catch up from chat. I think this question was mentioned in chat earlier in the talk uh, from the first part. And it's from Manuel who asked, when unified QA is trained, is the order of options shuffled? In other words, is the model resilient to option swapping order? It, I think it's a follow-up to the earlier discussion of how modular. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. We did not do that, uh, but... Uh... Maybe we should have. Uh, it is uh, my understanding was that uh, that the the gold labels that we got uh, they had enough diversity in terms of where the answer appears, first position, second position, and so on. That uh, kind of uh, hopefully it didn't bias uh, the system towards any particular position. But maybe I'm wrong. That's a good suggestion. Hi, Daniel. Um Hi. I thought the work was really, really cool. Uh, I, I think um, it's just really cool how modular QA seems very similar to human reasoning and like what happens in the brain with different brain areas. Um, I guess that kind of motivates my question, which is like, you know, often when we as humans are breaking down questions and we don't kind of possess the module that can break down, can, can solve the sub question, you know, we would go out and kind of learn it and train and do you know, simple tasks to learn that module. Uh, do you see kind of a role for this work in kind of identifying sub-modules that don't yet exist and that need to be learned and that can be composed uh, to make to make even a more general system? Yeah, uh, there is, 
uh, there is, thank you for the question. I think this is a very important point. There are so many important questions, so many compositional reasoning questions that are not even represented by the data sets that we have uh, currently out there. So we are not even studying them. Uh, um, and, and so, and when you don't have the data set, it's, it's also, it makes it hard to even study it. I, I think, so one, one thing that we are doing uh, in, towards making modular QA better is we keep like, we keep adding uh, better, better ways to train it in a ways that we'll rely less on these assumptions about different reasoning types. Uh, for example, one setup that we are working on now is, is making this training end to end, basically instead of building noisy training data and feeding to my decomposer system, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, very difficult, difficult pipeline. Uh, we want to really do it end to end, right? So I want to have input question, complex question and output answer. And the, the, the intermediate steps is going to be a dialogue between my decomposer and my frozen modular, my modules. I want to learn this in an end to end fashion. It is something that's doable. It's just a little tricky to really implementing uh, based on our techniques. That's something that we are doing. And I hope that will address part of what you're uh, aiming at. The other thing that maybe I should highlight is that uh, there is also a need for uh, defining, uh, uh, building better data sets, better challenge data sets for complex reasoning. Uh, there are already a couple of data sets, but I think this is just um, tip of the iceberg. Um, one, one, maybe one uh, plug uh, here that um, maybe I, I didn't get to talk about is uh, one data set that we have released uh, and we have called it strategy QA is uh, is, is, is another kind of uh, compositional reasoning data set in which the compositions or decompositions are implicit. So, it, it, and by that, what I mean is when you read a question, you don't see uh, how, uh, from the statement of the question, you don't understand, you don't see how you're supposed to decompose it. There's no signal in the statement of the question. For example, did Aristotle use a laptop? Obviously many of us would say no, but what is it about Aristotle that makes you think that Aristotle didn't have a laptop? Was it because he was Greek or was it because he was a philosopher? Was it because he lived a long time? And it's easy for us to do, but how do we enable machines to do that kind of decomposition? Modular theory is nowhere close to solving this kind of question. Uh, sorry, that was a long way to answer. Uh, no, no, I think I think that was great. Uh, it's really cool. To, uh, there's so many natural extensions that are baked into your work, which I think is, really inspiring um i guess if i could uh just ask a follow-up so it's my understanding that the the modules that you used are kind of predefined by the researcher um and ha what happens if you know you have a very you see a huge class of questions that you just are getting wrong and you may you need you need a fundamentally new kind of module like a new calculator or something yeah uh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I, I think the, the correct answer is no. Uh, sorry, I don't know. Um, but uh, as I mentioned, I'm, 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 I'm building an end-to-end version of modular QA that uh, I'm hoping that it will be more flexible than what we have now. So like, my hope is that, maybe I'm asking for too much here, that um, if you introduce a new data set with really difficult, with really novel problems, that system, <clears throat> oh, actually, that is assuming that I have the right modules. It will figure out what are the right decompositions. But I can see your question is, what if you don't even have the module? I don't know. But that, feel like, that feels like easier, easier part of the problem. Uh, if I can just bring one module. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Good reason. Thanks. Uh, John, you also had your hand raised. Yeah, um, but I, we're going to get a chance to talk later. Um, so if anybody else wants to ask a question, you should jump in now and ask it. And I won't look like Bill wanted to ask something. Yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, Daniel. Thanks for your great talk. I have a, a quick question about the modular QA work. I am not very clear like how you um, get the training data for training the next question and later for, let's say, the hot pot QA um, uh, data set, like 
because we don't have such um, like uh, uh, su uh, supervision for the training data, right? Yeah. And how, yeah, how did you manage to? Yeah, so um, yeah, we, uh, we, you're right. We don't have the supervision for uh, either hot or curate drop. Um, just let me try to summarize uh, the idea in high levels. Um, so basically the idea is that, um, let's say I want to solve drop and hot part QA with this quad, right? Um, but so in a sense, the, 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 drug, the compositions that they generate should be understandable to my squad. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a question generator system on this squad data set. And I'm going to form decomposition programs based on this question generator. These, de these decompositions are loosely function of the reasoning in the question. There's a, some type in there, a bunch of rules that tell me or give me hints about what, what is the likely type of the reasoning in this question. Mm -hmm. Those question generator systems create uh, the sub-questions or the compositions for that question type, specific to that type. That becomes my noisy supervision for decomposition. I train a system mm -hmm. uh, with the idea that hopefully this training will suppress part of that noise Mm -hmm. you know, it will learn to, you know, like suppress that noise and hopefully shift uh, the focus towards uh, what is correct, what is the right thing to do. And I use that train model as, you know, my actual decomposer. Got it. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so... John, do you want to ask your question now? Uh, I can ask my question, but it might be, I don't know if you want to answer it right now. Uh, I just wanted to know um, if you could, uh, how this work maybe relates to uh, like GPT-3, right? And these, these very large language models that do seem to do a lot of different tasks uh, and don't, uh, at, at, you know, with, with some context. And I wondered if you'd, you know, could place this work in that kind of context of the just very large and not actually fine-tuned, but um, large contexted. Um, <laughs> that's a really good question. Yeah, we have also been playing a lot with GPT-3. Right? It's impressive that you can like feed it like 10, 10, 10 examples from your data set and all of a sudden it starts just uh, behaving the way you, you have shown in your examples. Um, it's, I guess for now, it seems like a, uh, an elite club kind of technology. OpenAI charges you for you know, every thousand, every token that you ask, you know, they, they charge you for something. Uh, for now, it's not as accessible, but maybe you're right that in maybe in five years, uh, every kid is, is gonna have a GPT-3 and maybe in their phone. So it, uh, all of us are gonna use that. Well, the, it, the, real, the real issue is whether or not, I mean, they're basically just, throwing tons and tons of data into a big model, right? A big kind of amorphous model. Yeah. And uh, does that get you everything you need, right? Or is that the right way to go? I think there are elements of uh, elements that makes me positive about that. Uh, and that is um, one thing that I'm interested in, in, interested in is maybe Instead of instead of really learning learning um, in, in in the way we do today, which is to fit your model to a distribution of you know let's say squad and so on, I want to be able to describe uh, describe what is it that I want. Right? So it's more like learning from instructions or descriptions. So let's say I want to build a spam classifier. I shouldn't really create a data set for a spam classifier. I should be able to just describe what is spam, right? And I can do it easily because you know. I, I know that spams have catchy names or spam senders, they have really odd email names or they usually have links to uh, websites that are not you know, verified. I can describe it in English and I bet this description uh, is more reliable than any data set that you built for a spam classifier because the distribution of spams or the vocabulary that they use changes over time. So I, 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 like, I, like, to see, I like to see more of this kind of work as we make progress and as and as GPT or GPT like technologies become more accessible. Um, that, and that is exciting. I, I'm, I'm glad that we are making really fast progress on that. Great, thanks. 
Any other questions? Okay, great. With that, I think we can once again thank uh, Daniel for the great talk and also just give him a little bit of break before the one-on-one -on -one meeting starts at 12.30. Mm, look forward to, meet, to the meeting. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.